Dr. Joe Pug is a digital development manager in the archives sector development department at the National Archives. He leads the National Archives work to enable UK repositories to contribute remotely to the discovery catalog, for example. His digital research has focused on interface design, interface evaluation, and a wide range of methods for exploring and representing archival collections. Today, he will tell us about five approaches to enhance, rewrite, and recontextualize archival catalogs in order to meet the needs of current audiences. His paper is entitled Diversifying Databases, Five Easy Pieces. I'm really looking forward to the five pieces and I hope they are easy to implement by you. Welcome, Joe. Good morning and over to you now. Could you please turn on your camera? Thank you. So I'm really going to rattle through this. I hope you'll uh, I hope you bear with me. But five five allegedly easy pieces in in 15 minutes is not very long. So um, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about diversity in the context of databases? I mean, a lot of people have made it very clear um, that uh, if we're thinking about uh, diversity, that um, and we're and we're technical people, that diversity begins at home, and that. Um, you know, we can't have inclusion unless we're thinking about our data as well as other aspects of how service delivery works and happens. And what does that mean um, in practical terms beyond um, what Dr. Francis has said here? Um, what, you know, what we want are systems where people can find records that are of interest to them using terms they can think of and understand that nobody should be compelled to use um, uh, you know, offensive vocabulary as a search term in order to find records that they want to find. And the catalogues should hold what we know about records. Now, that seems like a rather fundamental, you know, what else, you know, what else do we put in catalogues? But actually, a lot of what we as archivists know about records, we don't put in our catalogues. And we're missing out um, context, things that um, are floating around in the heads of our staff members that are not necessarily um, encapsulated in our databases. So um, I'm, I'm borrowing from Stravinsky these these five uh, easy pieces. So uh, his, his first movement is Andante and this idea that we're going to try and make then the wrong words history. Now there are a whole bunch of projects out there now looking at how we do what is now often called reparative description. So where we, we know that our catalogues are replete with words that we wish that they uh, they weren't replete with um, and many people internationally are doing fantastic work in this area so Alicia Kil Chilcott has laid it all out in her excellent publication there's work going on at Libraries and Archives Canada um, at New York Public Library uh, New York University Library sorry um, the Tate um, have a tank project and the National Library of Scotland have just published an inclusive terminology guide which runs to over a hundred pages and at the National Archives, my colleague Grace Van Morick is looking into this as well. Um, and the thing about this work is that it is incredibly important, um, but it's also not sufficient. Um, we have to do more than think about um, these, the use of individual words. And that's partly because um, this work is often quite bespoke. So if we're working with an individual community to work out the, the most appropriate vocabulary, that is very time consuming. Um, a lot of these projects are led by the archives and they're governed by policy. They, of course, focus on the most um, uh, egregious words or some of them uh, do. And of course, terminology keeps changing. So this is this is great and important work, but it's never it's also never done because um, we're going to look back on it in a few years time and think, oh, how could we possibly have thought that those words were appropriate just as we're doing right now? So we have to think about what else can we be doing alongside um, these efforts? Um, and I'm going to propose that one of the things that we can do is say that it's time for the catalogue to hold many voices, um, what Stravinsky calls the Espinola. So born digital records change the way that we think about um, metadata and they change the way 
um, we populate our catalogues. So Matt Hilliard has proposed in his excellent seven pillars of metadata um, blog post, which everybody should read, um, seven kinds of metadata. And a lot of these kinds of metadata come from different sources. So they come from the depositor, they come from a system that we're running over um, a, a born digital collection, they come from the archivist, they come from some other expert and needing to do this. And this is very archival that, you know, the reason for this uh, coming about comes from some property of the records and not because of users. Um, but that's that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, grab onto this and, and, and seize hold of it and get something valuable out of it for for our users as well. So, you know, now that we're so interested in these different kinds of metadata and the provenance of metadata, that gives us the opportunity to do something different with description. So the idea that there will be one description for an object uh, is suddenly looks like a very old fashioned idea. Um, what we're gonna have is catalogs that speak with many voices, what I'm calling polyphonic description. And what that means is um, that we, we're, we're holding multiple views on an object from multiple different sources. Um, and it's very clear um, what that source is, where the provenance of information is from. So, you know, it might be an archivist writing today or writing a very long time in the past. Um, it could be somebody else with a connection to the records. It could be an academic. It could even be a computer system. And the point is, we'll be very clear um, when we're viewing a description, for example, from an AI um, or one um, written by a human being of, of various kinds. So uh, to take an example from um, CO 1069, so from the Foreign Office Photographic Archive, um, you know, this is the description that we have at the moment, the escort who preceded me during my last visit to Hombori village, note the trumpeter. Um, now that looks like an archival description in the sense it's in the catalogue, but it's actually written by um, the person who took these photographs. Now that's an incredibly valuable piece of information uh, about this document. You know, we know who took this photograph, which was taken by Arnold Hodson. You know, the catalogue doesn't conceal that, um, but at the item level, it doesn't make it very clear perhaps where this has come from and that this is written by the record creator and not by the archivist. Um, but should the record creator's um, statement be the last word on this document? I'm not sure that it should be. Um, you know, we might add an additional a description written by an archivist that will be slightly different. And we could add another description again, written by the AI. This is by Microsoft's computer vision uh, algorithm. Uh, it's not very good. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe back to the drawing board on that one, Microsoft. Nevertheless, if we, if we had a collection that we had digitized, but we didn't have descriptions for, you know, we can start to see that, um, you know, we can do useful things with these AI descriptions, even if uh, we perhaps don't want to put them immediately in front of people, but we're we're developing the idea that we might want to treat different descriptions in different ways, and that, that then the provenance of that description is, is you know is really obvious, and we certainly don't want to put a computer description in front of people and pretend that it's a human description and vice versa. So what what this is going to look like in reality, um, how we might display these um, descriptions, I think is quite a quite a vexed area. But in terms of holding the data. Um, sorry, this will be a very, 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 very brief kind of exigent into code. Um, but the idea is that you have a you have a core description. So you say, you know, you have uh, something at the bottom here that the um, we have P1 at the top here. That's a specialization of P. So we have a description and we have we have these agents. So agents are going to be a big part of um, uh, the, 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 the new way that our that our system will work. Um, so it'll be very clear who's created this description. And then here in this parallel description, some, we have some other description, the agent is different and it's a specialization of the same document. So this is how these descriptions sit in parallel in coding terms um, under the schema devised by our brilliant colleague, Adam Retter. Um, and um, the, the 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 tricky bit is going to be you know what how, how what what does that look like in a way that doesn't hopelessly confuse people um and makes clear that uh, one description is not secondary to another so there's no point in doing this if we're saying that um you know re okay there are a bunch of descriptions but the real one is the one that the archivist wrote you know that is not that's not necessarily the case 
um, and uh, you know one of the things that the a user interface sitting on top of that can't do is to suggest that that was the case. Um, so the, the the third easy piece in Stravinsky is uh, is the balalaika, and I'm saying this is you know an opportunity to bring data together. So um, a new system such as we're working on at the moment has the opportunity to bring in data from other sources. So firstly, from uh, the world of linked data, which is um, one kind of community production there are many hands working on something like wikidata and then um, but we can also offer tools within the system to support the creation of new meaning connections and arrangements so we have you know the conventional archival arrangement but we're going to have other kinds of arrangements uh, as well um, so wikidata can enrich what we know about record creators so in the national register of archives we're holding information about hundreds of thousands of record creators um but they tend to when we're when we're describing them they tend to be one thing you know somebody is either uh an mp uh or a farrier you know they're not often an MP and a footballer. And this doesn't um, you know, really capture the richness of uh, firstly people, but it can also lead to some awkward elision. So you know, if somebody is a slaveholder, for example, um, that's you know, obviously not, not all they are, but it's embarrassing for us to have to choose to call them that or call them a lawyer or call them an MP or some other aspect of, of their lives. So being able to um, supplement the data that we're holding with what exists out there already about individuals is very important. Um, we have a lot of women in the National Register of Archives, my colleague Caroline Catchpole is going to be talking about this, who we're treating quite badly in terms of currently describing them as uh, simply the wives of uh, other prominent individuals rather than describing them in their own right. And again, this offers us the opportunity to correct that wholesale. Um, there are only two kinds of gender supported in the National Register of Archives at the moment, which seems rather old fashioned to say the least. And um, there's the opportunity then sitting on top of this data to then provide richer faceting and searching. So to say, show me record creators um, from Nigeria, show me scientists who were also born in the continent of Africa. Um, so that's the kind of additional functionality that we can get if we're sitting on top of um, data that we pulled in from this additional source. And then thinking about rearranging what we have at the moment, um, e even quite uh, basic systems like tagging, of course, cut across existing hierarchical um, arrangements. And they're a bottom-up arrangement because you can have a system where anybody can come in and add some tags. Um, but the taxonomies that we use uh, also have the opportunity to develop. So at the moment, there's no taxonomy running across um, the, the portion of discovery that relates to records that are not held at the National Archives. And as we try and consider what those categories might be, both in terms of what constitutes a set of categories and what sits underneath something like you know what it, what is black history and is that um is that a useful term that we that we want to be using we can collaborate with um other organizations and individuals in order to um make pragmatic decisions about what those things uh, might be or even to allow them to run systems that are views on our data in which they've decided what the taxonomy is so you might have um uh, different organizations running um, search across uh, records in which different definitions of some of these terms are being applied. Um, and then finally, we hope uh, we have a we have a we have a, a tank bid in, but we hope we're also going to have the opportunity um, to allow people to form new connections between records and creators and the subjects of records as well. And subjects is always a rather awkward um, word to describe the people who are featured in records, uh, but that's sort of the yeah. best that I can think of. So if you know... Yes, Joe, could you hear me? Sure. Um, could yes, I can. Kindly, could you kindly sum up in a minute or so, please? Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, Thank you. Didn't, that didn't seem like 50 minutes. I went very quickly, but that's all right. I can, I can do this very fast. So five, was always, five was always difficult to do in 15 minutes. But basically, we are also having to think about how we diversify what we collect. So um, we know that we're piling up a lot of the same old stuff and we should probably stop doing that. We're using manage your collections to try and tackle that. I'm sure you will have your own plans. And then finally, and this is appropriate, it is a gallop towards the finish. Um, 
we need to push on with this work. So our audience has been waiting a long time for catalogues, which are easy to understand. They've been waiting long enough and we should do something about it. And if this seems like hard work, um, Stravinsky said they were five easy pieces. I can't even play the piano. There's fantastic work going on on this topic um, globally. And we're in very good company when we work on this stuff and we can all learn from each other. And that's what I'm hoping to be able to be doing in the rest of this session. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, very much for that. Ed. I don't think they were easy pieces, but they were thought provoking indeed. I'm very excited. Um, colleagues attending this session today, please uh, keep Joe's thoughts in mind and draft any questions you may wish to pose and, and, and post them as well in the Q&A function. So now we need to move on um, to the next speakers. They are Dr. Rosita Atanasova, a digital curator at the British Library, whose key research interest I understand is around the creation and enrichment of digitized collections and the innovative use of digital culture heritage. She is a member of the digital research team that is building digital scholarship capability at the British Library. And she is joined by James Baker, who is currently a senior lecturer in digital history and archives at the University of Sussex, and also I think a director at the Sussex Humanities Lab. From September, I've heard, he will become director of digital humanities at the University of Southampton. He's also a Software Sustainability Institute fellow and has worked at the British Library in the past. He researches the intersection between history, cultural heritage, and digital technology. So today, together, Rosita and James are going to present a paper looking into the computational analysis of catalog descriptions based on a project that uses linguistic tools and approaches for the analysis of collection catalogs. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnny, for this introduction. Um, we've got a joint presentation with James, um, and um, as mentioned already, we discuss a collaboration that brings together historical research using computational methods and the investigation of catalogue practice at cultural institutions. Within the framework of our collaboration, we're working with GLAM professionals to test corpus linguistic tools and approaches for the computational, critical and curatorial analysis of collection catalogues. In our presentation, James, who is the principal investigator, and myself, the co-investigator, will explain the background to our IHRC-funded project, which is a partnership between the University of Sussex, the British Library, and Yale University Library. And we'll talk to you about the engagement with the GLAM community as part of the development of online training materials, and as well as our future plans. So yeah, so the, the current collaboration um, builds on findings from an earlier project, which I just want to briefly go through, which was funded by the British Academy, which kind of demonstrated, we thought the value of the use of these corpus linguistic techniques for generating new knowledge about what we called curatorial voice, which is kind of cataloging labor happening in temporal and institutional contexts. Um, we did this based on a particular catalog I know well, the British Museum's Catalog of Political and Personal Satires, uh, that was written by the historian and curator, Mary Mary Dorothy George, often going back to Joe's point, referred to in the British Museum's archives as wife of Mr. Eric George, um, between 1930 and 1954. It was printed as a series of physical volumes and it's now available to search online in largely unedited form um, via the British Museum. It's about 1.2 million words if you, if you download the whole lot. Um, our aim was really to combine kind of computational and archival research to try and understand the kind of features of this cataloging of these sort of legacy interlocutors between um, us and the past their cataloging describes. Um, and one purpose of which really was to open up kind of new questions about the relevance of these kind of approaches for um, catalogers and curators. So could these linguistic approaches help um, the community better understand and contextualize their catalogues? Could it enhance access and discovery um, beyond squashing archaic vocabulary, which Joe spoke very eloquently about? Um, could these approaches to legacy catalogues enable action that supported kind of social justice goals, thinking about the structure of language and how that passes through time? And so we had workshops, which you can see on this slide, which we invited a number of professionals from the GLAM sector, um, 
primarily people who worked on image collections because they have kind of more free text we can work with to validate our questions and help to shape the kind of follow on work. Um, and we also drew pictures. And here's an example of us um, turning a description into an image and back into a description to really think about the choices that are made during cataloging an object. Um, so onto the next slide, um, this then did happen, this kind of follow on work. Um, funded by the Arts Humanities Research Council in the UK under um, the long um, titled scheme, the UK-US Collaboration for Digital Scholarship in Cultural Institutions Partnership Development Grants. And the partnership bit's really important here. And what it does, this, this work, is formalise the engagement between the cultural institutions we are working with before, so British Library and Yale University Library, specifically the Lewis Walpole Library, an 18th century research centre um, in the US, where they have comparable collections to the British Museum on the printed image. Our real our central gambit here is that if working on catalogues can't stimulate digital scholarship capacity in cultural institutions, then perhaps nothing will. And the project really has done four things to meet these ends. Um, first, we've co-curated training materials with the sector based on methods, which we'll talk about in a moment. Second, we started applying our approach to other collection catalogues than what we worked with previously. Third, we've moved from studying kind of historically specific voice in single catalogues to their transmission between institutions. So looking at how um, work from the British Museum moved to the Lewis Walpole Library over time, the cataloging labour that is, uh, where the provenance is not always clear, and trying to characterise the different types of transmission, direct, indirect, style-based, if some of them are kind of almost parodying or subverting the original um, descriptions written by Dorothy George. And fourth, experimenting with technologies to create new routes to think about the impacts of legacy descriptions on the present. So if we make a bot that writes, a um, that uses a legacy catalog data to produce imaginary descriptions of imaginary objects, which we have done and Yale are refining, what normative assumptions about the 1930s are then amplified in the present? What harms are kind of created through this kind of machine use of legacy catalog data? So last summer, um, if Rosita can click to the next slide for me, um, we held a series of online training sessions. Um, originally, of course, face-to-face -face didn't happen based on our methods and our data set, which was the original British Museum data set we had worked with. The sessions guided attendees through undertaking corpus linguistic analysis of catalog data using a GUI tool called AntConc, which those who do linguistic stuff may be familiar with. And we really are intended to gather input and ideas from practitioners in the sector on how to make these materials relevant and usable in their work. Um, we got some really lovely feedback, which we then used to, um, which kind of validated our approach but also gave us some suggestions for change which we then worked on through the autumn of last year. Uh, we moved to more typical data set that was a product of many hands rather than the very kind of consistent vocabulary you get from Dorothy George's work at the British Museum um, and we put in more guidance on how to for example find variant spellings um, and we Put more work in on next steps for example comparing catalogs and the result then is this online tutorial we produced um, which is hosted on github using openly licensed data provided by the british library around um, descriptions of photographic collections it's based on the carpentries lesson template and pedagogical principles and that's a long carpentries a long-standing software skills training initiative some of you'll be aware of um, and has a library iteration which i was involved in the formation of and so we think these materials are ideal for self-directed but also instruction-based learning um, and they can be reused and reworked at your leisure and it was tested then at a bunch of workshops which we held um, over the winter so as a summary of our workshops, um, we had about 30 GLAM professionals from the UK, um, the US and other countries who attended the ad hoc training sessions and then in the December workshop. And here you can see uh, James delivering our December workshop on Zoom um, and uh, some of the comments from the participants. Um, participants commented that the tool that we um, introduced them to was easy to set up and use that without any prior knowledge uh, of the tool or the data, they were able to follow the instructions and work through the tasks in the small breakout groups. They said that the workshops made them think about catalog data in a new way um, and felt they can easily pass on their newly acquired skills to their colleagues. Um, some were impressed with the speed with which the um, Unconc tool produces results 
and um, with how quickly one could draw conclusions from the outputs once provided with guidance on how to read the results. As James explained, this is a tool developed for linguists with linguistic conventions in mind. There was clear enthusiasm about trying out um, this computational approach with um, the, uh, people's own data, both as a starting point for working with new catalogs as, and as means of providing new insights into catalogs uh, people knew well. Um, in the first instance, um, professionals thought they would adopt this methodology to better understand the use of language in legacy catalogs, identify problematic terms, as we've already heard, um, and cleanse data from errors, for example, errors introduced by automated text recognition software. Others said that they would be interested in examining more advanced linguistic patterns, such as lemmata, and in using materials, the materials as a starting, starting point for learning more about corpus linguistics and natural language processing. Everyone seemed um, to enjoy the inter interactive element of the carpentry style lesson and found the materials to be an appropriate introduction to the tool and methods. This type of collaboration has been transformative in other ways. Um, the British Library's involvement in the project stimulated many informal conversations with catalogers and curators at the library who are transforming lengthy and complex catalog entries as mentioned, created by many hands over many years into standardized modern catalog records. Staff were interested in learning more about um, this new approach in order to gain a fresh perspective of the data they were working with and tease out the different voices and personal views in the text. Um, the British Library Digital Research Team, um, of which I'm a member, run mon monthly informal hands-on sessions and known as Hacking Yaks, and you can see our logo here. The sessions give staff the opportunity to trial new methods and technology and help skill building. So last November, as part of this project, this collaboration, we invited interested staff to work with our online materials and think of how they would apply this to their own collections. These interactions led to a new bid submitted uh, for the follow-on funding called by the IHRC and a NEH in the same strand, which unfortunately wasn't funded on, on that occasion but which received very positive feedback and validation of our approach. And importantly, the activities of the project informed discussions around collection metadata strategy and standards, particularly those linked to the British Library anti-racism action plan um, and complemented other activities um, such as the uh, Qatar Digital Library analysis of terms in English and Arabic, which um, um, uh, may be again offensive or problematic. Um, and um, we yeah james do you want to continue <laughs> I, I was going to just i was going to add at this point that i think some of those informal interactions are some of the real value of doing a project like this for me and in that spirit for example we produced um, what we're calling a provocation which you can see on this this slide in the middle on presenting legacy catalog data really inspired by how news websites kind of flag old articles um, mocked up against our partner catalogs including here um, at the walpole um and um you can, I think one of the things that's going on here as well is that um, alongside other kind of, there's other library materials here that we kind of unexpectedly engage with, which became a, a real value um, of the work. Um, if we just move on to the, the next slide, um, we're also doing this to some, with our partners at Yale as well, which I've not really talked about. Um, and I'll just spend the last point, like last points thinking about. Um, here at Yale in particular, we focused on analyzing transmission of text and style, as I said, from the British Museum catalog of satires produced at the beginning of the 20th century to the cataloging work that was, that was happening at the Lewis Walpole since around the 1950s. Um, and much like we analyzed the British Museum catalogs in previous work, analyzing Lewis Walpole data really has thrown us back to the archive to try and reassemble the processes used to produce catalog data at the Walpole um, in the 20th century. This has been led by Cynthia Theodore Roman at the Lewis Walpole Library. Um, and as ever with going back to the archive, it is incredibly time consuming, both because of COVID times, but also because of something Joe said around the fact that so much of the kind of practices of cataloging in, in the 20th century and even, even beyond really are in the head, heads of many catalogers. Um, and this is really expanding beyond the life of the project to something I suspect Cindy and I um, will be working on for many years. Just as um, 
a final point while we think about the future, um, we'll just finish with some thoughts on next steps. Um, we have been incredibly delayed in this project by COVID, but still been able to run a transatlantic collaboration. Um, and what we're going to do in the next nine to 10 months is trying to do some knowledge exchange and partnership development to identify common areas of interest in the sector, um, but also among the research community who work with collection catalog data. Um, the first is event in July to dig deeper into our outputs, including some hands on work and look at some next steps. This will, of course, be on Zoom and is more or less kind of full, but I think we can squeeze people in if they really want to come. Um, the link is there. Um, we'll then, COVID willing, be inviting um, colleagues in the glam sector, technologists, curators, researchers um, to our final project workshop to be held in early 2022, which we hope to be another catalyst for change by positioning the kind of core functions of cultural institutions at the center of digital research and computational methods and by exploring how we can together work on the analysis of catalogues and to create kind of positive change for users and communities and for ourselves. And I think at that point I shall finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, both Rosita and James, for your presentation and for your research and for sharing the outputs and the workshops in the GitHub. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to remind uh, attendees uh, to pop the questions for Rosita and James and the Q&A. I already have a couple of questions for Joda, so this is wonderful progress. So it's now time to turn our attention to Roxanne. Roxanne Missinger is University Librarian and Chief Scholarly Communications Officer at the Australian National University. She has been President of the Australian Library and Information Association and has researched the scholarly ecosystem, particularly around digital libraries. Her experience has been transformed by disasters in the past three years floods, bushfires, hailstorms, building fires as well, and obviously pandemics as everybody else. And that has given her time to rethink collections and access. Her paper at DCDC21 brings us some philosophical insights and is entitled Remaking Collections in Times of Crisis, Insights from Epistemological Theory. Roxanne, we are listening to you. You're joining us from Australia. It's wonderful to have you. Over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just start my screen. From the beginning. Um, so I should say thank you very much and greetings from the Southern land. Um, I like to start by uh, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands will I meet with you and airwaves, uh, the Ngambri Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also pay my respect to other first peoples. So we've been doing quite a lot of thinking about collections for a number of reasons, mostly to do with disasters at the moment, and really trying to say in terms of our library and archive collections, what is the purpose? What is it that this new world brings, these new opportunity brings to us, and what, are, what is the actual uh, strategy that we need to think about in terms of engaging with our universities. So I really love this quote from Neil Gaiman. Uh, he talks about books being a way we commune with the dead, bringing lessons from the past, building knowledge, uh, changing our knowledge through the culture, uh, and bringing those tales through the buildings and the ownership of resources that we have now. And that traditional concept, concept of ownership um, and control uh, uh, is really being rethought in terms of what we do with access. And we've had some brilliant examples so far today, and I hope to add a little bit more richness in a different dimension. So why is epistemology important for us? So epistemology really is about the study of knowledge, who believes what, whose knowledge is it, and there's a lot of history and a lot of references at the end of this paper in terms of that ownership. We've talked about decolonisation as a way of, if you like, decoupling from the past and recoupling with a new future. But again, that raises the issue of 
who owns the knowledge and who in translating that knowledge into cataloging records is actually providing a new ownership and how dynamic that should be and what parties should be involved in that. Epistemology really has been fundamental to the, the nature of library and information science uh, and really is our catalogues are constructed to control that knowledge, but that knowledge in many ways has been controlled by those who created the collections. So by the publishers, by the documenters in archives and the catalogues in, record, catalogues in recording this knowledge really justify that within an orderly unconscious structure, which is starting to become more visible because of the lens that we're applying to collections in this day and age, to understand them within their time, but to reconceptualise them within our time and hopefully in a way that won't freeze that again within a particular ethical framework. So within library and information studies, we've really seen epistemology as a way of characterising our experience about saying that the knowledge that was the knowledge of the creators becomes the knowledge of the shared system through a new policy that we create. Um, and we've been criticised for being conservative by reflecting the collection building as the outcome rather than talking about the dynamism of the creation of knowledge and the recreation of knowledge and access through our record system. So when we've been really rethinking the collections, we've been saying, well, what is our analysis of history? How can we take into account a new scholarly ecosystem, particularly one which requires the unleashing of knowledge within a digital humanities framework? So when we review the past, we really know that, if you like, history was written by the winners, uh, that particularly a lens in Australia now, thanks to the work of um, Bruce Pascoe uh, through his Dark Emu book, Researching Archives, uh, the records of early explorers, that a lot of information about native people in Australia, their agriculture, their way of life, their culture, was recorded but has been suppressed since then. So, what does this mean for the control that we have and the way that history is reinvented? There's a lot of uh, psychological research around the bias that sits around the nature of the written word about the recording of history uh, and how can we apply that in a new and different way to think about unleashing material that will actually uh, revolutionise and open up both the education experience and research for the future. So we've done a number of things in the past about connecting history. So we've been part of the Fragmentarium where um, I was going to say many of the uh, works that were of value have been disconnected and sent around the world in different ways and can be reconnected digitally. So we look at histories, we look at recreating history in a new and different way. But there are many stories that really reveal that we are dealing in reconstructing with what has been uh, a practice in the scholarly ecosystem that has suppressed many of the voices that we really need to have on the historical record, which raises a new challenge and a different way of thinking. So we've often thought that history was biased in terms of the records, but that we are we're now living in a wonderful age where all is revealed, where we have fought the battles, we fought the battles of gender equity in the 1970s and we've achieved a new environment. Um, well, we are not there yet. And this example from the Public Library of Science, who we would think of as an ethical publisher, publisher really reveals the systematic uh, biases, the systematic constraints on our scholarly ecosystem. So two female scientists, one of whom was a relatively uh, early career scientist, submitted uh, an article to the Public Library of Science. It had one peer reviewer who was male, who wrote, uh, it would probably be beneficial to find one or two male biologists to work with to prevent the manus manuscript from drifting too far away from empirical evidence. This, you might say, is extraordinary, but this is a sign that the world that we are creating records from, 
that we are adding to our collections is still systematically um, challenging and how can we tell the story so people recognise what is within the system, what the constraints are in the system and how can we unleash that in a new and accessible way. So we need to think about dramatic opportunities, dramatic different ways that we can make this sort of transformation in a way that hasn't been imagined before. For us, believe it or not, um, the opportunity to really reinvent and think about our collection within symbolic and political frameworks happened through a disaster. We were unfortunate enough to lose about 300,000 volumes in a flood. In February 2018, the university campus, the part of the university we sat on was the subject of a massive flood. You, the um, image on the top right is pretty much the view from my office in the JB Chifley Library. So that is the library that serves social science and the humanities uh, and business and economics. So the flood came in, we had superbly efficiently stored collection material uh, in the basement, in the ground floor. And you can see that the water was around a metre deep and remained that deep for more than three days. February, summertime, humidity of around 60 to 70%, uh, classic situation for mould. And the inevitable happened. We were um, we both, we were unable to actually even get into the collection for three days. Uh, but by the time we could get down there, the collection was not salvageable and we had to make the decision to dispose of the collection in order for mould to not be through the, throughout the building affecting the rest of the books. So what does that mean for us in terms of rethinking and rebuilding a whole new collection? Well, we've been at this now, well, um, I could talk about the insurance claim for years, but uh, we got $41 million from the insurance claim and we have now rebuilt the uh, floor to be one that is a study area only. So it is uh, desks and we will no longer have collection material then. But we have been scouring the world's suppliers to try and find collection material and after a very significant investment in uh, in every country in the world, because we had material from around the world, we've been able to replace about 37% of the collection. But about 60% about we think we will probably never be able to replace in print. So what does this mean for us in terms of looking for a corpus of knowledge? Well, it means we really have to take the opportunity of the digital world to say we are going to move on, we are going to create a digital corpus of knowledge and we're not limited by the selection we had before, we can invest in a new and different way. Some of the findings in terms of thinking big to create this sort of transformation uh, have been discoveries around the parlous state of our metadata for historic collections. So we are doing a major project to reform that and reinvent our records to take a, a new world. In terms of the, the enormous effort that was put in past years to say we will have this publication and not that publication and have selective uh, statistics, to have selective material from individual authors, we're now able to say, well, we're going to think and we will have all of the works that were ever published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics or all of a particular collection of British statistics and not be as selective. So that's a really important different way of thinking about filling gaps and making that available nationally. And we're also thinking in terms and experimenting uh, with digitisation of material because we have to do the digitisation and we're seeing how we can work with Tesseract and Textract to actually do natural language processing and transformation of the printed word into digital humanities resources. So there are many challenges in this. Uh, we've been talking to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, for example, for more than two years about how we could obtain, they have it on microform, the whole set of their publications and make it available digitally. Only to the university, not to the wider campus. 
they find that very challenging. And I've got to say in two, two and a half years, we have made no progress. So we're going to have to go to a plan B to, with a copyright exemption, work with uh, the National Library to do the whole historic range of those resources. Other publishers uh, are somewhat easier to deal with, and we've particularly been working with JSTOR and ProQuest to do the historic journals. But many of the works that we lost are less than 70 years from the death of the author. So copyright remains one of those impenetrable problems for us. Um, but we are working on different forms of uh, access control and particularly working internationally because we are a fair dealing regime in Australia, not a fair use regime. So we must look more broadly in order to find our solutions. So in terms of the metadata, we need to transform that and also think about the whole of data and how we can make that more accessible. We need to fix our records. We're collecting in new and different ways that hopefully will mean there will be less gaps. And we are also able to use some of our flood money to actually get digital access to whole archives. So it's not just, if you like, the winners who write history, but it is collections that are deep and archival that can make a, a research student's life and a researcher's life uh, much more enriched in terms of the work that they can do, particularly given that over 80% of the material we lost was history and philosophy. So we're really having to think in a new way about corpuses of knowledge, about records, about interactions uh, with our clients and about storing and creating knowledge for the future. So in terms of working with national discovery systems, all of our records go into Trove, but we've done a lot of work for the digital products in terms of optimization with Google Scholar. And in terms of thinking about this epistemology, this rethinking of knowledge and our role as um, access rather than control and thinking holistically, it really, there's a lot of alignment with thinking about civic epistemology at the moment that's happening um, with disaster theorists and social science and science policy experts. So we're trying to incorporate that into the way we think about collections um, in new and different ways and to work very closely with our academics to understand the concepts that they want to apply around collections, digital corpuses of knowledge and access control. So basically the, that traditional concept of locked knowledge carefully chosen where possibly more time was spent choosing material uh, than was actually spent buying material is having to be unlocked and we're needing to think about our collections, our metadata, our services in new and different ways, including linkages uh, with creators, creating institutions uh, and new and different forms of storage and access. So in my paper, there's quite a lot of references as well, um, but because we have to be very careful about time, I might finish now if that's all right, Joan, and um, hopefully we've got lots of questions. Thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxanne, for your insights and for sharing your experience and your approach and, and flagging that, that conflict, perhaps, between intellectual control and access control, which, which is a matter that concerns us all. And it's at the core of what a catalog is and what a catalog is for. I'll stop talking now. Thank you to all of the speakers. I'll thank you again at the end of the session. I have a few questions for several of you, and I'm quite glad that I have already three for Joe because I cut him short earlier. So without further ado, I'm going to begin looking at those questions. The first one is asking us, uh, Joe, does this mean that we have the end of control vocabularies? Is this the end of the control vocabulary? <laughs> I mean, it'd be quite interesting to know what James thinks about that. I, I mean, I think I just think that's a it's a myth. The you know the controlled vocabulary is a is a you know is a kind of unicorn. Um, 
that we've never really, even, even when vocabularies are controlled, they're controlled within usually a small part of one institution. And they're certainly not controlled um, really across whole catalogues or certainly not between institutions. So I would say, uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> and a kind of, you know, mythical bygone age of, of controlled vocabulary is, 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 is rather a myth. And I'm, and I'm not sure, therefore, that we should mourn it. Okay, thank say, you. Do you want me to say something briefly? If you can, James, yes, go. I've, I mean, controlled by whom, right? They, they're kind of, you know, imposed, situated and positionally inscribed knowledges, right? So they have utility as so long as you, I guess the thing is going back to Joe's point about um, provenance is if you know people are using them, then that helps you understand how they use them, right? Um, I think H Hannah Turner's book on cataloging culture is a really good way of thinking, uh, has a really good way of thinking about how these kind of knowledges are produced whilst looking at the Smithsonian as a case study. Um, and I guess I, I find them very useful and I have used them and I know colleagues who use them. Um, and, you know, in the work that we do computationally, sometimes they can be a really useful starting point for trying to think about, you know, whether or not a control vocabulary has been used at a given moment, given there are lack of records to describe its use. But if it's being cited as something someone is using in a process, then it becomes an incredibly useful tool later down the line, I guess, for understanding what what uh, an individual collection or institution might want to change about the way a catalogue has been produced. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next. I have quite a few. Again, for Joe, um, a colleague wonders, how open can the catalogue be? Should anyone be able to come to a catalogue, another description of the record, perhaps with a self-declaration of where the perspective comes from and whose descriptions would get priority by default? So there's plenty to to untangle in there. Yeah, those aren't, so uh, the, the, there's a sort of implication there that people can't do that now. Whereas of course, anybody can write an email to the National Archives suggesting a catalogue correction and Jonay's team um, complete, I mean, huge numbers of those in the course of a, of a year. So we're already in a place where we sort of do that. And the question is, is kind of about mediation and moderation. Um, that you know, because clearly the, the you know the, then there's somebody there making a decision about the, the the content of that correction and how it's going to be deployed. So so this is sort of sort of about degrees, and I think it will be very dependent on um, the on the project and kind of what's going on. Because if we think about how much stuff there is in these catalogues, after all, we're not suddenly gonna be generating huge numbers of alternate descriptions for every item at once. You know, that there are lots of different strategies that are gonna be being used in different parts of the catalog. Um, and so I, I, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to work out, you know, so take tagging, for example. Um, Discovery already has a tagging system and anybody can log in and tag anything with anything. Um, but at the moment that data isn't, um, it's, it's run effectively in parallel um, with the, um, uh, the rest of the catalog metadata. They're not really um, together in the same system. Now, if they were, you would need um, certainly more um, uh, oversight than we uh, have at the moment. I mean, because the, that that separation allows that to be very very light, and it wouldn't be completely appropriate to allow anybody to to tag any record with anything. I mean, you can see that there are all sorts of potential issues there. So as these things get glued closer together, then you know the, there's a um, the, that the, you know that there has to be some kind of examination of what's what's going on there. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, there's still the opportunity to give give away. Um, I think you know certainly more control than we than, than we have done up, up until now. Um, on the question of uh, what what uh, description has primacy, um, that that's also quite difficult. Uh, it was very interesting in what James was saying about um, you know kind of flagging legacy description. I think that's really interesting. And so you might just say recency. <laughs> you know that. The, the, the most interesting description is the one that's been written most, most recently, maybe, um, if I was having to do it uh, as one blanket rule across the system. But again, in practice, I don't think it will be like that. I think the different kinds of description will lend themselves to different um, things. And it might be that the archivist description, for example, is particularly good for findability. 
and that uh, another kind of description is more contextual. And so we might even decide that we don't want to show the archival description, that the archival description is sitting as a metadata layer that we're searching across, but maybe it's not the most important one that we want to show, first of all, for this particular record or collection. Very difficult to say because we're talking in very abstract terms, but that's quite possible. Thank you. That, that's very useful. There are lots of possibilities and issues in there. And I'm going to reframe myself because I do have views, but I'm just the chair today. So the next question is, again, it's for you. Uh, this person uh, thanks all, all speakers for the talks and would like to ask a broad point about the approaches described. So can the provenance of the catalogue be retained so that as terminology is updated and improved, the historic terminology, even the offensive, is somehow preserved. I ask the latter in terms of recording change rather than causing offense. I want to acknowledge the need to change and become anti-racist, for example, more inclusive, but wanted to understand how we capture the cataloging history of biases and omissions in the past. This seems to be important in the context as well. It is a, a mix of uh, an observation and a question, and I think it could be asked by anybody initially was sent towards Joe. It's about preserving the offensive original terminology and the history of the cataloging history of biases and change of metadata. So I, I, I would be very interested to hear what um, other people have to say. I mean, I would say that that is sort of what we're in the business of, of doing with this extra, uh, you know, having having these very problematic descriptions is much more problematic, I would suggest, when they are the only description. And as soon as we're able to hold them alongside other kinds of description, then, um, you know, we're able to put them in their proper um, historical context, which is to say they are a, they're a product uh, of the past um, and we're saving them because, you know, the, the, the creator of that record has something to say about that record that, um, you know, is not, is not intellectually accessible to us now, you know, because it, you know, it has, it has value beyond um, what's in the record itself. Um, and I, I don't think anybody's suggesting with reparative uh, descriptive work um, in general that we're going to throw those things away but you can see that if you've only got one description that's you know that, that that's a real tussle um, but that's why I'm, I'm hoping that the, the, the framework within um, uh, Omega this way of holding um, versioned descriptions from from different sources is going to be really valuable. Okay. I, I'll stop you there Joe I have a final question um, for you, if, if, if you could answer quite quite quickly. Um, yes, is how would you then envisage showing these multiple descriptions to the user? And it goes into the solution rather than the problem. So uh, th uh, that, that, that's a very, uh, so, the, 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 so the, qu the quick answer is, uh, I don't think we know yet. Okay. Um, I, you know, that's, we're gonna have to, um, we're going to have to, uh, you know, test that with users, basically, to try and identify ways of not creating a confusing mess and making sure that people can really see. But again, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn back to the, um, the, that very handy prototype that, that James showed. So we can, we can start to see what some interface features might be like to help us flag up. Um, that a legacy description is a legacy description, for example, and that an AI description is an AI description. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think this is an area where we're, we're definitely going to have to do some work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions for Rosita and James here. Uh, the first one is about what are the key drivers for this type of collaboration? Why don't you go, Rosita? Um, so yes, um, I think as, as Joe has explained already the context, um, we've got a lot of um, uh, catalog records and we are trying to kind of reevaluate those. We want to also um, ensure that the collections are more easily discoverable. And we also want to um, develop new skills within the, within the uh, sector, within the um, library or the GLAM community. So um, this kind of partnership with James, um, trying to look at uh, catalog data in a different way and trying sort of different approaches, which give you 
um, glimpses into the data initially as a word list and then within words within a context and then um, try the, the process of actually iteratively working with the data and asking questions and, and um, querying it um, um, kind of um, and working together with the curator. So it's not just one person looking at the data, but it's the data being looked at um, with, with someone who's interested in, in archival history, with a curator who knows the provenance and the history of the collection. So this kind of process um, is really, really um, um, stimulating and as well as, as well as us learning more about the tool and the computational um, analysis, linguistic methods, and, and uh, turning that into some sort of uh, training, um, using the training materials we developed for the project, turning that into um, kind of um, uh, using that for um, in enabling others within the organization and within the community to do similar work and enabling the dialogue. So I think uh, just having the dialogue with the different kind of stakeholders um, um, for, for us has been particularly interesting. And um, James, um, um, as, as he mentioned, he had a previous project which kind of caught our attention. So several of us attended his uh, workshops uh, where he was working with satirical prints. And within the library, we've got a lot of um, collections which haven't been catalogued. And we want to see whether we could use some of those legacy descriptions and where the kind of the biases may be and what we should be aware of. And uh, certainly uh, my collection metadata colleagues, uh, curators in the library, um, uh, staff at the library are thinking very broadly about the um, systems and how um, appropriate our cataloging collection management systems are, um, controlled vocabularies as we've already discussed, um, and, and just the um, kind of um, quality of our metadata. So how to, as, as um, Alan already, Alan Sadler already asked in his question, how to flag up um, um, legacy descriptions, how to flag up any potential kind of historic biases, um, use content warning. So kind of there, there were a lot of um, questions that are being asked. This, this project is a kind of vehicle for, for dialogue and, and bringing in, of course, new kind of approaches to um, with, with computational analysis. So I can pass over to James because uh, perhaps I kind of uh, went uh, level was, down from the big, big kind of drivers. Um, I, I was going to address, sorry, sorry, Rosita. I was going to address the next question to James. So maybe he's able to make a point on the previous answer and, and answer this question as well is, what problems might be tackled by using the project tools and methods? And I would also add, what is the impact that you would expect? I mean, I think it goes back to something Joe said actually about not just looking for individual vocabularies. Um, I'm not a corpus linguist. My, my colleague Andrew Solway, who I work with, is a, is a corpus linguist. Um, but what he's kind of taught me is that you know you can you can learn a lot about the structure in which people um, communicate, um, and then you can look at other kind of comparable collections or similar things and try and see if there are patterns that are occurring elsewhere. And so for me, it's about things like trying to say, well, you know, are are it is a particular collection catalog working with um, being assertive, for example, or does it spend a lot of time actually trying to be honest and hedge the fact that it maybe doesn't know things? Um, and if we can start understanding that, we can start pairing that with different types of vocabularies and whether um, problematic words and phrases come up to try and see if we can join that kind of worldview perhaps as coming down of someone being assertive. So the work we did with Dorothy George's catalog, for example, very much fits into a mode of early 20th century women working in, in sort of power academic institutions um, being almost over assertive because of the ways in which they're working in a patriarchal profession that kind of in, in order to be listened to they have to be very confident um, but then when we start doing things like playing around with a bot and making a catalog uh, making sort of imaginary descriptions from that kind of data we find very different things so we found for example that um, that it's very obvious when you start training a machine using catalog data that it does these weird quirky things that you've never seen before. So for example, um, if uh, a description says, starts with say a man, for example, or a citizen, 
you quite quickly realize there's all this kind of stuff loaded in there that's an assumptions about what a man looks like or what a citizen is, which means if you're feeding that to a machine, then and they're becoming the basis of some kind of AI futures, then there's a real problem in how those machines are interpreting what is normative. I know that, that Thomas Padilla was tweeting last night about a project he's starting about ground truth, about saying, well, what ground truths are culture institutions using to create machine learning um, capabilities? And how, what do we need to know about these, these kind of the formation of these ground truths in order to think about the kind of impacts they're having um, kind of further down the line? Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I have a, a further question that could be answered by more than one. So I, I will look at your smiles to see who wants to take it. Do our collection management systems need to keep pace with our need to accommodate and document these processes, for example, the audit trails, the provenance of metadata, and how do we progress this with the vendors? I think this is something quite important for the archive sector. Joe, James. I have something very quick to say is that a historian, I would always say, yes, keep more. But one of the really interesting things I've found when talking to colleagues at cultural institutions is that they often tell me things like, oh, our systems used to be able to do this. So like in the late 90s, early 2000s, they had, they had kind of edit trails and you could use them like modern GitHub systems to show you the trails of edits. And then when the vendors started producing more generic solutions, all that stuff went. And that feels like there's a lot of people trying to put stuff back. I know the National Gallery are doing a lot of this at the moment, trying to put back in some of that history of the ways in which their collection catalogues have been gradually assembled. And it feels to me like I'm, I'm not in the sector, right? But it feels like the technical solution being offered by vendors have squashed things that people seem to want. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's really very useful. I want to move on now to a couple of questions towards Roxanne. And because I'm aware of the time, the first, the first one is about copyright. Well, what would be the effect of copyright on this sort of reformation of collections? Um, so what I might do is just take the discussion a little bit further about who owns the metadata and who owns the, the context that we see it in and then, and then work that towards a copyright issue. So part of the challenge in the addition of terms in the control vocabulary we've used is that it has been culturally biased. And the challenge for us when we're looking at our Indigenous collections is there's not, if you like, one unbiased source of truth now. And if you talk to five people, you'll probably get seven different opinions mm -hmm. about language, which is good or bad. And one of the things about dealing with the historical materials is we're often taking language that was very euphemistic. So, for example, if you've got books or photographs of women who were ar arrested for vagrancy in Melbourne around 1900, that just means they were prostitutes. Doesn't mean they were vagrant and homeless, they were prostitutes. But because of the way we've interpreted different language over time, social conventions, you, your record itself um, has things that need to be unpicked. And one of the challenges or opportunities for us, I think, is to say, how do we have a layered approach? So we have the original materials with the original descriptions, we have an interpretive layer which says, you know, if you're using the term prostitute and you're looking at 1900 records, you need to, it will be automatically translated for you as vagrants. And then you need a third layer about individuals that perhaps learns in an AI way what their special interests are and interprets that in a different way. Um, in terms of copyright, I think copyright has been a really big challenge for us just in having a sufficient corpus of knowledge to do some of this research on. We're just doing strategic planning for our university and I had to write a paper on the perceptions of the university over the last 75 years, because it's our 75th anniversary. And I could find fantastic material um, up to 1962, when the 70 year copyright um, uh, uh, hits the rubber hits the road. Um, so I could write all these wonderful stories about our first 15, 17 years, and then there was a bit of gap and I could only get the material that we had digitised that was um, our own record, so our own slightly biased annual reports, which were remarkably honest in those days. So I think there's some um, research purpose that we need to weave into new ways of releasing information plus thinking about the layering of interpretation of records themselves. 
I've got more euphemisms. I could write a whole book on euphemisms. <laughs> and that, that would be a very interesting read. I do love uh, euphemisms and synonyms and, and all of that. I have time for one final question, which is again for Roxanne. When, what is the advantage for the user when rebuilding collections, when you take that approach of operating at collection level rather than at item level? Um, so, and I'll refer here particularly to our historians, often they are omnivores who are very frustrated in terms of their knowledge appetites. Um, so they want to play the music to take a previous presentation on a larger scale, and they've been frustrated because particularly in the era of microform, we've only been able to buy bits. Uh, but one of the great things about getting $40 million is all of a sudden you're thinking on a whole new scale and you can get the whole collections and then they can think more intelligently about the research that they will do uh, and see the library in terms of its value as uh, significantly a partner in creating those new research opportunities. And it's a real infrastructure move to think of as a systems and infrastructure, not just as repositories. <laughs> 